What we need to do is come back and focus on Christ's words to us and look very closely at his strategy as revealed in Scripture as to how we can reach the nations of the earth. And so let's look at that for a moment. Here's where we, I think we need to take a little bit of a trip of imagination, if you will. We need to go back in time, 2,000 years. And when we go to an upper room, we find 11 frightened, confused, ordinary men. Some of these men had education, some of them did not. Most of them were just working class men, like fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. One of them was a political troublemaker. Another one was a dreamer. And into this room where they think Jesus is dead, Jesus is gone. What are we going to do now? When are they going to come for us and kill us? Into this room steps their risen Savior. Hallelujah. Now, you and I would like to say, well, praise God. They probably all started praising the Lord, and it was all wonderful, and they had a Bible study and a prayer time. Well, no, the reality is it probably terrified them. And as a matter of fact, when you read about it in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, you can see they were terrified. They were absolutely frightened. They thought Jesus was a ghost, a spirit. And Jesus said, whoa, hold on there. Touch me. Ghosts don't have flesh and bone and blood. You can see it is the real me. I have risen from the dead. And in this moment, Jesus gathers his beloved disciples to him, and he says, I'm about to leave here personally, physically. I'm leaving your planet. But in this moment, I want to tell you the most important thing I have to say to you, and it's about your mission, your purpose. And this mission and purpose wasn't just for the original 11. That mission and purpose comes to us today. And we can read about it in all four of the Gospels, as well as in the book of Acts, and that is called the Great Commission. And this Great Commission has been given to all of us. Let me give you those passages of Scripture where you can read about it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. He promises authority and presence. In Mark 16, 15 to 18, he says, when you go preach the Gospel, these signs will follow those who believe as evidence of God's presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, 46 to 49, he says, Wait in Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. So let's put the book of Acts together with the Gospel of Luke, and it's kind of a two-volume set of the ministry of Jesus, what he began to do and teach, and then what he continued to do through the early disciples through the book of Acts. So Luke 24, 46 to 49, he promises the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, he again says, Wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And then in John chapter 20, the Gospel of John chapter 20, 21 to 23, also John 17, 18 and 19, here again, we have the Great Commission being, being spoken. And Jesus is saying, as I have been sent, so send I you. And he, again, he promises the Holy Spirit. Now, when you study all of these Great Commission scriptures, two commands emerge from the original Greek language. Now, when I first read these scriptures, I thought, well, obviously a command is go, go into all the world. As a matter of fact, let's look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus says here, he says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We love these scriptures. Well, here Jesus is making a command. There are only two commands given in all the Great Commission scriptures. When you put them together, you look in the original Greek language, there are two commands that are given. The first one is found in the Gospel of Mark, where, he, where Jesus tells his disciples, preach the gospel. You remember in the earlier teaching, we talked about what that gospel is. What are the parts of the gospel? The gospel is not something we get to make up or add something to it. 
we cannot add to it. We cannot take away from it. If we do, we will be under the judgment of God according to Scripture in Galatians 1 and Revelation 22. But we have been given the gospel. We are to preach the gospel. Now, what is the second command? The second imperative in the Greek language is not go. I thought it was go, but when I investigated it, it is actually on make disciples. Make disciples. Jesus is commanding us to make disciples. The going, the baptizing, the teaching, these are all participles in the language describing how the preaching and discipling will take place amongst all the peoples of the world. But we have been given two commands. One, preach the gospel. Two, make disciples. Now, right away, in our modern thinking, we would say to ourselves, well, I have to go into all the world and I have to bring the gospel to everybody and I've got to teach them how to obey the Lord and walk with Christ. In our modern way, we would think, well, okay, we've, we've got to start with a vast organization. We've got to have huge amounts of money. We need lengthy schooling programs, language programs. We need training. We must do intensive demographic studies of population movements. And by the way, did I say we need a lot of money? Well, that's how we think today. But the reality is what Jesus presents to us, what is really needed is an infinitely reproducible model that is transcultural in any way. In other words, it can go into any culture that is not limited by how much money you have, how much education you have, or how much personal ability, talent, or intelligence you have. And most of all, it must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. The mandate to make disciples in all nations is not merely making converts in all countries. Here's where we need to think very clearly. Pastors, leaders, we think that if we've made a convert, well, we're done. They just need to come to church now and everything will be just fine. As a matter of fact, I've served amongst leaders who believed that if you basically attended church on a regular basis, you were being discipled. Well, I have to say, this is simply not true. There are many people who attend church who were baby believers when they first started, and they're still babies in their faith years later. The mandate from Jesus Christ, the command, is to make disciples in all nations, not merely making converts in all countries. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. You know, a convert can only be born again by God. When you look at John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, a convert is born not by man, not by the will of man or the ability of man. It's born by, he is born by God. John 3, 5 says we must be born again. God is the one who gives birth to converts. But disciples are not born, they are made. That's what Jesus said, go and make disciples. And we're going to talk about that process through this teaching. 